Let us call ourselves to worship with excerpts from the 69th Psalm attributed to David. It is for your sake that I have borne reproach, that shame has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my kindred, an alien to my mother's children. It is zeal for your house that has consumed me. The insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. When I humbled my soul with fasting, they insulted me for doing so. Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good. According to your abundant mercy, turn to me. Do not hide your face from your servant, for I am in distress. Make haste to answer me, draw near to me, redeem me, set me free because of my enemies. We are joined together in spirit as we share in our prayer of confession. Let us pray. We praise your abiding guidance, O God, for you sent us Jesus, our teacher and Messiah, to model for us the way of love for the whole universe. We offer these prayers of love on behalf of ourselves and our neighbors, on behalf of your creation and our fellow creatures. Loving God, open our ears to hear your word and draw us closer to you, that the whole world may be one with you as you are one with us. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our First Testament reading is from the book of Jeremiah, the 20th chapter. O Lord, you have enticed me, and I was enticed. You have overpowered me, and you have prevailed. I have been becoming a laughingstock all day long. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I must cry out. I must shout violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become, for me, a reproach and derision all day long. If I say, I will not mention him or speak any more of his name, then within me there is something like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I am weary with holding it in and I cannot. For I hear men are whispering, terror is all around, denounce him, let us denounce him. All my close friends are watching me to stumble. Perhaps he can be enticed and we can prevail against him and take our revenge on him, but the Lord is with me like a dread warrior. Therefore my persecutors will stumble and they will not prevail. They will be greatly shamed, for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. O Lord of hosts, you test the righteous. You see the heart and the mind. Let me see your retribution on them, for to you I have committed my cause. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy. From the hands of the evildoers. The author of Jeremiah writes, Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hands of the evildoers. Now it's pretty much the same sentiment Jesus voices in his prayer to his Abba. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. The temptation is to resist the call God makes to us to be healers and peacemakers by conforming to the rules of men that are contrary to the laws of God. Jeremiah laments, all my close friends are watching me to stumble. Perhaps he can be enticed. We, we can prevail against him and take our revenge on him. Now, it's a great temptation to conform to the world's rules and do things we know are not what God created us to do. You may have had a similar experience at some time in your life to the one Jeremiah writes about. The power of peer pressure is intense. We may know what it is God wants from us, but we find it difficult to follow that path. And yet the pull of God's love is also strong, and 
Jeremiah is torn between those two forces. If I say I will not mention him, or I speak any more in his name, then within me there's something like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I'm weary with holding it in. I, I cannot. When we resist the path God calls us to follow, it can be agonizing because we know in our hearts what we should do, but we fear the social consequences of doing it. In the end, of course, Jeremiah chooses to follow God. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hands of the evildoers. Standing up for the interests of the poor, the lame, the outcast, the abused, and the oppressed is never easy. The folks with the money and the power will always use that money and power to protect their own interests at the expense of those who seek to share their own piece of God's bounty. The powers that be actually have come to believe that what they have and what all creation offers to all God's people actually belongs to them, not to God. Jeremiah insists they will not prevail. They will be greatly shamed, for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. The momentary pleasure of exerting power, of exploiting the earth's resources for their own benefit, are just that, momentary. Yet God's kingdom is eternal. And the God of Jeremiah, the Abba God of Jesus, calls us for that kingdom to be cared for, for all of creation. That means the earth, the waters, the skies, the animals, and most important of all, God's people. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The evil is not only the adversaries who exploit the earth and the people, the evil is also ourselves. When we choose to turn a blind eye and allow the powerful to exploit the weak, in God's kingdom, the rich shall be laid low and the poor raised up. But that won't ever happen if we continue to lie down in front of those in power and allow God's rules, God's earth, and God's people to be trampled. May we have the strength to resist the evil around us, stand up for this broken planet and the broken people, that all might be healed and God's kingdom restored. May it be so. Amen. May God's powerful love lift you up on eagle's wings.
Please join me in prayer. Gracious and loving God, creator of the universe, we come to you with our own agendas and we're often afraid and sometimes ashamed that what we want for ourselves may not be the same as what you want for us. Help us to center ourselves during this time of worship to respond to the divine presence you make known to us when we are listening. Be present with all those in need of your grace and healing. We do not mean to put that on your shoulders, but realize we're actually asking for the strength and courage to respond to their needs ourselves. We know we keep asking for you to fix things that we need to be actively fixing ourselves. But so much of our world is broken, we don't know where to start. Help us to start with ourselves by removing the logs from within our eyes before attempting to remove the speck from the eyes of others. Help us to move on from there to those in need of encouragement and of healing, those who are suffering, sick, and oppressed. Indeed, some of our brothers and sisters are suffering, sick, and oppressed. Give us wisdom beyond human knowledge by showing us the divine purpose for each one of us. We pray for the sick, for our church, for our community, for all those in need. And we ask all this in confidence in the name of the man who called you Abba and taught us to pray by saying these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our epistle reading is from Paul's letter to the Romans, beginning with the sixth chapter. Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we, who died to sin, go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. A reading from Matthew's Gospel from chapter 10. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. 
If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those in his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both the soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs on your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The word of the Lord. Praise God. Jesus does not sound much like a peacemaker in this passage. Do not think I have come to bring peace on earth. I have come not to bring peace, but a sword. He doesn't sound like he's very pro-family either. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. But no, this is not a call to arms or a call to destroy families. It's a call to take up the cross. If God's kingdom, God's intent for creation, is ever to become a reality for any of us, the change needs to be radical. You can't pull punches. You can't cop out. People are dying and starving and being oppressed everywhere, not just in first century Israel, but in 21st century America. We don't get away with not being part of an intense and radical change in how we live together, how we treat one another. Now, it would seem ludicrous for Jesus to say, are not two sparrows sold for a penny, and yet one, not one of them will fall to the ground apart from my father? So, do not be afraid. You're far more valuable than many sparrows. And then in the same breath, he says, I have not come to bring peace but a sword. Now, if he values human life so much that he thinks they're worth so much more than the sparrows that God protects, what's all this talk about swords? Jesus is keenly aware that if we want to make God's kingdom a reality, we have a fight on our hands. Too many people have too much self-interest in the status quo. They really have no interest in having the rules of society benefit the poor, the sick, the destitute. They follow the line of the Dickens character, Scrooge, referring to prisons and food pantries of his time. Scrooge tells the gentleman collecting funds for the poor that he has no interest in giving his money to the poor. I help support the establishments I, I mentioned. They cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there. To which the men reply, many can't go there, and some would rather d die. And he replies, well, if they would rather die, then they better get to it and decrease the surplus population. Many are that cynical. Having a few ghostly visits finally proved sufficient to pry the money from Scrooge's greedy hands, but that was fiction. In the real world, it's much more difficult. 
And it takes more than prayer because God has neither the hands nor the arms nor the legs nor the feet to fix this problem for us. Our prayers must be for the strength to be persistent enough to force change. And yes, I did say force change because no one makes changes willingly. But Jesus is not making a call to arms. He believes, as did Jeremiah, that the eternal divine God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jesus the Christ will ultimately win as long as people are prayerful, persistent, and patient enough to wear down those who would oppress their brothers and sisters. It can be frustrating when it seems things will never change. But God is in this with us. And we must be the arms and the legs and minds and heart to hear the call of the divine and lay our lives on the line for God's kingdom. May it be so. Amen. May God's blessings of laughter and love and life be seen by others in everything you do. And may God's presence abide in you and through you. Amen. <laughs>